Hello my friends around the world. It seems like it's been forever and a day since I did a new installment on this reading of the Go Show. This is the unanimous declaration by the Buddhas. I'm almost done with this one. This is installment number nine. I have in my notes here where I wrote down end of nine. Or this is installment number ten because I wrote end of nine. I gotta get my drink. Hold on one second. <clears throat> I always realize how dry my throat is once I start talking. Okay, it's that time of year where I gotta wear the hats and stuff, and pretty soon I'm gonna put many layers on. Okay, I hate this time of year in Japan. I wanna get out of Japan. It's uh, now December 1st, getting colder and colder. I got two heaters going in my room. Okay, here we go. The 10th installment. After I read this one, I'm going to read Letter to Mishima, which I was written about the same time as this Go Show was. And I think it covers a lot of the same stuff, so it'll be a good transition. Okay, the quote, resolution on reprimanding other schools, end quote, by San no In, contains this passage of refutation, quote, in general, we speak of the 80,000 Buddhist teachings, but if we make an overall survey of them, we find that there are none that do not belong to one or another of the four teachings, as I have shown at the beginning of this work. These four teachings, the Tripitaka teachings, the connected teachings, the specific teachings, and the perfect teaching. So there's four, over 40 something years that he taught. <clears throat> the Buddha taught four main categories of teaching and the final teachings, the perfect teachings, contain the Lotus Sutra, which he's talking about here. Okay, this is still part of the same quote. And the perf uh, pertaining to the vehicle, sorry, the perfect teaching pertaining to the vehicles of the voice hearers, the cause awakened ones, the Bodhisattva and the Buddhas. So the first Tripitaka teaches was specifically for the voice hearers, which is uh, a level of his moving up towards enlightenment. Um, it also represents the world of, let me see, hell, hunger, animality, anger, tranquility, or humanity, heaven, learning, realization. So learning. The next stage is realization, otherwise known as cause awakened ones. And that was the teaching, the connected teachings. And then the next level, altruism or bodhisattva, for the bodhisattvas was the specific teachings. And the Buddha, respectively. So the final teaching, the perfect teaching was for Buddhas. Like you and me, we're all Buddhas from time without beginning. Which this Gosha says, in other Goshas I will be reading. And the Lotus Sutra says it, and I'll be reading the Lotus Sutra after I'll read all these Goshas. Okay. <clears throat> but if we examine the doctrines expounded and the principles underlying them in the true word, Zen, flower garland, three treatises, conscious only, precepts, Establishment of Truth and Dharma Analysis Treasure Schools. These are the seven or eight major schools in Japan at the time. How do these go beyond what is set forth in the four teachings? This is still part of the same quote from this, this guy, uh, San no In, which I'll read in the footnotes who exactly that is. Okay, if one claims that they do go beyond them, then they must be non-Buddhist doctrines or heretical teachings. And if they do not go beyond them, then one must inquire what goal they are intended to achieve. That is, which of the four vehicles mentioned above does one hope to achieve? So the four vehicles are the learning, realization, bodhisattva, and Buddhahood, otherwise known as uh, <clears throat> voice hearers, Cause Awakened Ones, Bodhisattvas, and Buddha. So which of those four vehicles is the teachings meant to be taught to or 
the people who learn those teachings, what are they meant to become? And the final teachings is you meant to become a Buddha, which we all are, just to remember who we are. And depending upon how that question is answered, one should then examine their fundamental principles to the fullest and admonish them for their errors. In doing so, one should employ the classification of the four teachings set forth by our own school and base one's conclusion on this. If the, goal, if the goals that these other schools aim to achieve differ from those set forth in our teachings, one should then take them to task for this. Now then, as regards the Flower Garland School, it sets forth its various practices which act as causes and the various results or goals that these are intended to achieve within the framework of the, of the five teachings. These practices fall into different categories such as initial, medial, and latter, and are not uniform in nature, which one type of teaching are with one type of teaching intended to achieve one particular result. But if the causes and results in their scheme do not conform to those outlined in the Tripitaka connecting specific and perfect teachings, then this is not a Buddhist teaching. So those are the four categories of Buddhist teachings. So if these other schools of Buddhism don't go within those four categories, he's saying they're not Buddhist teachings, even though they call themselves Buddhist teachings. Okay, this is still part of the same uh, quote from Resolution on Reprimanding Other Schools by Sano Ying. Sounds like a Chinese name to me. Okay. When it comes to the thrice-turned wheel of the law expounded in the three treatises school or the teachings of the three periods expounded in the Dharma characteristics school, one should determine whether such doctrines are sound or not. One should ask what vehicle the the practice of such teachings is designed to achieve one of those three those four vehicles if the reply is that they are designed to achieve the vehicle of Buddhahood then one should point out that they do not include the meditative practice required to achieve Buddhahood if the re, if the reply is that they are designed to achieve the vehicle of Bodhisattva, then one should point out that there are two interpretations of the middle way. That which sees the three truths that make up the middle way as separate entities, and that which sees them as an integral whole. And ask which view is held by the school of the person being questioned. If the answer is that they are regarded as separate, then point out that these that there is no way that the desired goal can be achieved by such means. If the answer is that they are regarded as an integral whole, then raise the same objection as one did where the goal to be achieved was that of Buddhahood. If there are those who mistakenly reply upon the recital upon the recital of mantras, then point out that unless one has an understanding of the wonderful teaching of the threefold contemplation in a single mind, this is um, by Tian Tai then one is no different from a follower of the specific teaching and can never gain enlightenment as to the wonderful principle underlying existence. These are all still quotes from the same writing. If this way one should, in this way one should investigate to the fullest the goals aimed at by these other schools and criticize them on the basis of true principles. 
that is, the principles taught by our own school. The principles of logic are addressed to non-Buddhist believers. Such principles are in most cases associated with the Hinayana or specific teaching doctrines. In comparison to the teachings set forth in the Lotus Flower Garland and Nirvana Sutras, these are intended to serve as an introduction to those higher teachings. They are designed as temporary measures to fit the particular capacity of the hearer and to lead and guide them. Their ultimate purpose is to enable non-Buddhists and followers of Hinayana teaching to come to an understanding of true principles. Therefore, when discourage, discoursing Sorry, therefore, when discoursing on Buddhist teachings, one should keep in mind the goals aimed at by the four ranks of sages and not become unduly concerned with the particular doctrines or principles of logic alone. Also, when asserting the doctr doctrinal tenets of other schools, one should examine them in the light of the tenets of one's own school and judge their correctness accordingly. But this must not be done in a hard-headed or hostile manner. On the whole, the other schools in most cases hold doctrines that pertain to the first three of the four teachings and seldom touch upon the principles of the perfect teaching. Because <clears throat> the perfect teaching was only really taught in the Lotus Sutra. So if they don't use the Lotus Sutra as their main text, then they're, they're, there's no way for them to have the perfect teaching. Okay. <clears throat> this, then, is the judgment on these matters pa passed by the sages of former times. The great teacher, Chiso, it provides... So this is the... That was the end of the quote. So this is now Nietzsche in talking... This, then, is the judgment of those matters passed by the sage of former times, the great teacher Chiso. It provides a mirror by which one may unflailingly perceive and judge the principles set forth by the various schools. This is why he, he studied all the Chinese great masters, and he was able to, to debate anyone on Buddhist, any Buddhist priest in Japan and blow them away. And every time he did that, everyone would freak out because all the other, their followers would all join Nietzschean and then the, the, the monks who lost him in debate would go to the, le the leaders of their specific area in Japan and try to get those leaders to fight against Nietzschean because he was taking all their followers just because he was using the Buddhist text to dispute everything they said, which is what a Buddhist should, Buddhist should do. Okay. Why then do the scholars of this latter age f fail to look upon it, but instead rashly presume to judge the doctrinal teachings on their own? So, during the latter day of the law, which is the time of Nietzsche and I shown in the beginning of the latter day of the law, the fifth, the fifth 500 years after the historical Buddha died, which was the beginning of the latter day of the law, which we believe is around this time, all the Buddhist teachers at the time weren't using any of the historical texts and all the classifications why something should be above and why something should be below. They were just using their own reasoning, which was totally perverted, because that's what Latter-day meant was a time of total perversion of the teachings. Okay, except Nietzsche. He, he went specifically to the, go, to the sutras and to the commentaries on the sutras that were, you know, really came to the correct understanding of what he understood through, this, through the sutras. Okay. It is essential that one give close study to the three teachings that run throughout all, through all Buddhism. These teachings are the sudden teaching, the gradual teaching, and the perfect teaching. These are the unity of the three truths set forth in the sacred teachings of the Buddha's lifetime. The first two teachings, sudden and gradual, 
were expounded by the Buddha in the first 42 years of his preaching life. The perfect teaching was expounded in the last eight years. Together, they represent the teachings of a period of 50 years. Outside of these, there are no other doctrines. How then can you fail to understand them correctly? When one is still at the stage of an ordinary living being, these three teachings are referred to as the three truths. When one has attained the goal of Buddhahood, they are called the three bodies. So the three bodies of the Buddha. Um, it's another way of saying your physical body, your consciousness or your energy body, and your thoughts uh, or your feelings, which is your, uh, some people would say subtle body. But the three bodies of the Buddha are really every living being that's alive now because we're all Buddhas. That's what the final teaching pretty much said. The three bodies of the Buddha are what everyone has. Those are the three truths. They're you and me. We are the three truths. Okay. We'll get to that in later Gosha. And when I read the actual sutra. Okay. Once again, when one opens up and merges these so that one can perceive that the three truths constitute a single entity... Actually, let me go back. When one is still is in the okay, when one is still in the stage of an ordinary living being, these three teachings are referred to as the three truths. When one has attained the goal of Buddhahood, which is what you are when you open your eyes and you wake up, which is taught in the opening of the eyes on Sato Island, they are called the three bodies. These are different names for the same thing. The process of expounding and bringing them to light is known as the sacred teaching of the Buddha's lifetimes. The Buddha's lifetime. <clears throat> when one opens up and merges these so that one can perceive that the three truths constitute a single entity, this is to attain Buddhahood. So as long as you know that this three bodies of the Buddha and the three truths are all just just your life, it's consciousness, it's life, then you are a Buddha. That's all you have to know. This is called opening up and merging, and this is the teaching that pertains to the Buddha's enlightenment. Okay. <clears throat> in, the doc in the doctrinal systems expounded in the other schools, these three truths that constitute a unity are treated as separate and expounded under eight headings. One of these eight forms one of these eight forms the basis for a particular school. Thus they are all lacking in the principle of full and perfect unity and hence have no truth by which one may attain Buddhahood. So if you take the, the whole we try to understand the whole based on the parts, and the parts aren't complete. The only the whole is complete, which is all oneness, which you are. Um, you're gonna have a distorted view of of the whole, but looking at each part separately. No matter what you look at. In these other schools, there is no possibility of truly attaining Buddhahood. Therefore, one dislikes them. But what one dislikes about them is the fact that these doctrines are insufficient. When one turns to the perfect teaching, however, and sees that all phenomena are perfectly fused together, that means all is oneness. We are oneness. You are me, I am you. You are Nichiren, I am Nichiren. You are Shakyamuni, you are Zadartha, you are Gautama, Gautama, whatever you want to call him. You are a Buddha from time without beginning. You are the Bodhisattva Jogyo of the Latter Day of the Law. You are the Awakened One from time without beginning. It's all one, because it's all oneness. Okay, whatever, na whatever names you want to call. You want to say Maitriya Buddha from the future. It's all the oneness. You're all that and more. That's what you're going to... Once you, my next song comes out, you're everything and more, you'll understand it anyway. Okay, I'm going to go on here. 
When one turns to the perfect teaching, however, and sees that all phenomena are perfectly fused together, full and perfect, like the moon and the fifteen like the moon on the fifteenth night of the month, so they were on a moon cycle back then, which all cultures were, which wasn't fucked up by the Julian calendar. One month equals one moon, so on the fifteenth of the month you get a full moon and that's perfect. That's how all months should be, 28 days or so. Then you have 13 months in a year, like a normal uh, year. Okay, anyway, that's a whole other subject. Free of all insufficiency. And when one understands them to be fullest, then there is no more judging them as good or bad, no more choosing on the basis of what is timely, no more need to seek out a quiet setting. No more question of which persons are eligible. When one understands that all phenomena whatsoever are manifestations of the Buddhist law, then one has fully comprehended the nature of the things of the phenomenal realm. Then, even if one follows a path that is not the way, one will still be fulfilling the Buddha way. Isn't that beautiful? You can't do anything wrong if you understand that you are a Buddha from time without beginning because no matter which way you go, you're going to end up getting back to the truth because you are the truth. If you, Once you understand that the Gohonzon is you, you are the Gohonzon. The mystic law is you. You are the mystic law. The Buddha is you. You are the Buddha. There's no way you can go wrong. That's what he's saying here. And he says it in many other goshas. And I'm going to go to those goshas next because some people stupidly believe that this is not written by Nietzsche and Daishonin. But anyway, we'll get into that later on when I read the ones that they do believe that are written by Nietzsche and Daishonin, which say the exact same thing. So it's kind of like, okay, he said it twice and you don't believe it the first time or the second time. Okay, anyway, let me take a drink. Ah, so much fun out there in the land of fairy tale make believe of I'm not a Buddha. I'm just an ordinary mortal, which is just a complete lie. Okay, heaven, earth, water, fire, and wind. Sounds like a band. He or that's earth, wind, and fire. Heaven. heaven, earth, water, fire, and wind are the five wisdom thus come ones. They reside within the body and mind of all living beings and are never separated from them, even for an instant. So you are all the seasons. You are all the planets. You are everything. You are everything and more. Song to come up. Soon on MTV. Okay. Therefore, worldly affairs and affairs relating to enlightenment blend together in harmony within the mind of the individual. Outside of the mind, there is absolutely no other thing that exists. Therefore, when one hears the truth, one can at that point immediately attain the goal of Buddhahood without a moment's delay. Did you hear that? Can I read that again? So if you if you understand what I'm saying, you're already a Buddha. Otherwise you wouldn't have got to the tenth installment of this because you are you would have turned it off and and, and been an inchantika, which is walked out of the ceremony in the air before the perfect expedient means was claimed. So if anyone thinks they're not a Buddha, they're an inchantika. That's the only two options you get. You're either a man of incorrigible disbelief, woman of incorrigible disbelief, or you're a Buddha. Okay, here we go again. Therefore, worldly affairs and affairs related to enlightenment blend together in harmony within the mind of the individual. Outside of the mind, there is absolutely no other thing that exists. It's just all a process of your imagination because you were in a holographic matrix all created by our thoughts and feelings and emotions and our actions and our words. Okay. <clears throat> Therefore, when one hears this truth, are you hearing it? <laughs> one can at that point immediately attain the goal of Buddhahood. Did you hear me? Okay, you guys are Buddhas. Thank you very much without a moment's delay. And it is a principle of the utmost profundity. So if you thought I was just joking that you're a Buddha from time without beginning and 
you thought someone you put on a pedestal that died a long time ago was that person, not the one you are alive now, because you are him and he is you, he, she, whatever it is. Because in the ceremony, before the ceremony in the air, the first person that attained Buddha, Buddha in the in the Lotus Sutra was the the Dragon King's daughter. So that is you too, woman or man, whatever you choose. Okay, we're all Buddhists from time without beginning. The three truths that form a unity may be compared to a jewel, its brilliance and its precious nature. Because it has these three virtues, one is a jewel, a brilliance, and a precious nature. So these are the three factors of life. One is form. Honoze, sonoze, shonoze, tai. Honoze, sonoze, show. Honoze, sonoze, show. Appearance, nature, and entity. That's what he's basically saying. These are the three truths and the three factors. They're all the same. The physical body, which is the form. The nature, which is all the feelings, all the emotions, all the other stuff. Thoughts. And then the entity, which is neither of those things, but comes together as those, which is the consciousness, which is life itself. Okay. Once again, the three truths that form a unity may be compared to a jewel, its brilliance and its precious nature. Because it has these three virtues, it is called a wish-granting jewel. So the Gohonzon, which is up here, which I'm not going to show you, you can look at pictures online if you want, I don't want to show mine. Um, it is open now on my, on my altar over here, which I'm going to chant more to before I go to bed, because I'm feeling good now. I was feeling good before I started reading, but now I, I wondered why I waited so long to read this 10th thing, because I just needed to totally get high on life to read it. Okay, I didn't do any of that or anything like that, because I'm, I'm high on life. I don't drink much alcohol either, occasionally. Okay. So why it's called a wish-granting jewel, and it can serve as a symbol for the unity of the three truths. But, if these three virtues were taken apart and treated as separate entities, which science does, science says the only thing that can be proven by science is that which can be observed, which they think is physical reality, which is one third of reality. Um, that's pretty much a religion now, most of it's scientism. Then, okay, so if these are taken separately, the three, the three realities, which is physical reality, spiritual reality, and the entity or the consciousness of all reality, then the jewel would be of no use. So if you had a jewel, and it was just the jewel, but it had no brilliance, and it had no precious nature, then it wouldn't be a jewel. It would then be comparable to the various schools that expound expedient teachings in which the three truths are regarded as separate from one another. The jewel itself is comparable to the Dharma body. This is the three bodies of the Buddha, the Dharma body, the law body. Its brilliance to the reward body, which is another three bodies of the Buddha, which is all oneness. And its precious nature to the manifest body. Manifest is the physical body. When these three virtues, which form a unity, are treated as separate entities, the schools are established on that basis. One dislikes such schools because of their insufficiency. But when the three are combined to form a single whole, this is known as the unity of the three truths. This unity of the three truths is comparable to the thus come one of original enlightenment. Did you hear that? Original enlightenment. That means from time without beginning. Whose three bodies are in fact a single body. In terms of the four kinds of lands, the land of tranquil light is comparable to a mirror. And the other three lands, the land of sages and ordinary mortals, and the land of transition and the land of actual reward are comparable to the images reflected in the mirror. 